um, All right, so we finally made it. Uh, I want to give a big thanks to my mate Alex, who uh, flew over from Europe. He road tripped the ATMs with me in an Escalade from San Jose to here. Um, the whole time I'm thinking, please don't get pulled over. Please don't get pulled over. <laughs> Two ATMs in the back of an Escalade and about 6,000 notes of novelty currency. I mean, what are you boys up to, you know? <laughs> but we made it. We got them to the casino, so we're all good. Um, the attraction to target ATMs is fairly obvious, I mean they're full of cash, but for myself it's kind of part of a bigger picture and a bigger plan, and that's to uh, explore systems that when compromised have direct and immediate consequences. You know, society relies on various proprietary systems, whether they be ATM machines, medical devices, smart meters, parking meters, or uh, the computer system in a vehicle. It's important to research these systems, particularly they're often not designed with a secure methodology, uh, as a result of that research, we can use that knowledge to design better and safer products in the future. So my goal, uh, the goal of the talk is to spark discussion on the best ways to remediate and prevent the attacks that I'm going to be demonstrating. The goal definitely isn't to give a cookbook recipe on how to hack ATMs. You know, uh, I find the process of finding vulnerabilities a little bit more interesting anyway, the journey not the destination, although the destination is pretty cool in this, uh, in this one. And I hope to change the way people look at devices that, from the outside, um, are seemingly impenetrable. So current attacks are uh, the skimmer, which is certainly a fan favorite, uh, small overlay that slides over the card slot and the pin pads, manufactured to blend seamlessly with whatever particular ATM it's manufactured for, designed to both capture the track data on the cards as well as the pin numbers. And you know, technology in some of these is no joke. Data that gets transmitted over GPS, some even have tamper protection. They wipe themselves and find out and send the remaining data back to the attacker. Uh, physical theft and RAM raids. You may have all seen those uh, YouTube videos where a couple of good old boys pull through the front window of a store, attach the chain to an ATM and the other end to their pickup truck and take off with it. Uh, not the most subtle of attacks, but um, that's ninja status compared to some of the other ones. And we have card trapping and card snooping. Card trapping where uh, someone will insert a small shim commonly known as the Lebanese loop, into a slot, traps the cards, and they're designed in such a way that when the card's read, it'll be read but won't be returned to you. Often combined with shoulder surfing to get your pin, or they'll get your pin in uh, ways that may not be quite as friendly. And then safe cutting with frontal attacks, basically going at the ATM with a pair of pliers and a blowtorch. Um, explosives, which is surprisingly popular, which I find a bit odd. Uh, the attack is literally tying a bunch of explosives to an ATM and blowing the crap out of it. Now, you'd think blowing up an ATM would be somewhat counterproductive, but uh, this is big in Australia, so you go figure. <laughs> Sorry, Australians. And, <laughs> and data breaches, uh, hacking the back end, so hacking the bank processor, harvesting the card data. An example of this would have been the uh, compromise of the Royal Bank of Scotland will pay back end. Certainly the safest and was the most technically sophisticated attack that I've seen. I think about nine million was stolen during that attack. And then I guess we have miscellaneous, uh, other. So there would have been the default passcode attack from a couple of years back, uh, where if the operator password was left unchanged on the machines, you could reprogram the ATM to think there was a uh, lower denomination in the machine than there actually was. So you know you could program it to think it's full of $5 notes when it's really full of 20s. And I'll be adding some more to the other category, practical attacks, which in my opinion um, blow John Connor's one right out of water. So I've picked standalone ATMs, and there's a few, reason, a few reasons for that. First off, they're pretty easy to get a hold of. You know, you jump online, and like anything on the internet, you just add to cart. Um, getting the ATMs delivered to your house, though, is actually quite interesting. Um, I had the ATM delivery guy literally wheel in one of the ATMs, and he came in, he's like, what on earth do you need an ATM in your house for? And, <laughs> 
And I, I was feeling a little bit cheeky at the time, so I just looked at them like, oh, I don't like the transaction fees, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and he just kind of shook his head and went on his way. Um, but also, they're everywhere, you know, every bar, convenience store, market, and they're often in secluded areas, you know, they'll be out by the restroom, tucked away in corners. Um, but I will be discussing attack methods for both standalones and hole in the wall ATMs. I'll go over walk up style attacks, but then I'll shift focus to a far more important vector, and that's the remote attacks. And particularly what an attacker can leverage through a successful remote compromise. And when I say remote, I mean remote default, because that's the only way to roll, really. Um, so just to get an idea of how popular these ATMs are, this is just uh, one block on my street from a bit of a pub crawl. Um, I must say my favorite is the guy who owns a Mexican restaurant here holding his bottle of tapatio over the top of the ATM. It doesn't exactly look chuffed to be there though, but you know. So this is the standard specs of a new model retail style ATM, generally Windows CE running an ARM processor. Our new models support both TCP IP and dial up by default, optional wireless. When I say wireless, I mean uh, CDMA, not 802.11, because so no drive-by ATM attacks, unfortunately. Thought it would be kind of cool to ride by and just have ATMs spit out cash. <laughs> Although maybe the Grug could possibly do something with this. Um, SSL support and a triple desk encrypted pin pad. So the pin pad performs all the encryption within the device itself, has anti-tampering me mechanisms, and I may talk a bit more about that beast a little later. Uh, so this is a typical ATM internals, uh, a bit hard to see, but there's a receipt printer over to the right, a card reader, and there's a serial interface that leads down to the safe, which is wired to the dispenser. And there's various motherboard inputs, multiple USB, SD card, uh, the network connection, and some debugging ports. Um, on this one, there's actually a cover in there that's protecting the circuit board. I simply just removed it for photo purposes, but I guarantee both of these ATMs are completely untouched and completely unmodified. Now, funnily, funnily enough, all the ways that an ATM talk could possibly be disrupted, it was actually almost my cat who took it down for me. Um, I had a USB keyboard plugged in, and he was chasing a moth or something, and he ripped out the USB port and then pulled out the processor plug-in at the same time, but... Luckily, the only damage was a USB plug that was easily soldered back in. But anyway, bad kitty. Um, so in my, in my opinion, a presentation shouldn't really be a full-blown technical tutorial. So I'll be following up later <laughs> with a white paper that goes into more technical details. But rather than digging deep into the ins and outs of C internals, I thought I'd sum up the security hurdles I faced with this quote. We were concerned about protection, but not about security. We weren't trying to design an airtight system like Windows NT. <laughs> and, and this was from Thomas Fenwick, who was the creator of the Windows CE kernel. And this quote came from a book called Inside Windows CE, which is uh, interviews with the core developers of CE. And it's an interesting read on the design, design approach that was taken, but um, essentially there were not many roadblocks. There'll be, uh, the technical information, I think, lends itself better to a white paper, which I'll be following up with. So before we can even think, think about giving um, that dude from Terminator 2 a run for his money and actually start devising attacks, the first step is to be able to interface with the ATM and gain access to the file system. So once we have access to the file system, we can then pull the executables and be able to do some reverse engineering. Now, unfortunately, when the ATM boots, it boots directly to its own proprietary application, so there's no Explorer shell. And we need a shell to be able to make things easier. Originally, I suppose naively, I thought I could just plug in a keyboard and Alt-Tab, but of course, that wasn't to be the case. But to get a shell, we'll need to have Explorer execute at boot time. Um, so the CE application boot sequence is fairly straight straightforward. The kernel nkexe runs filesys.exe, filesys sets up the registry and file system, and then it executes the applications that are listed in the registry key hklm init. So the trick is to patch the application we want executed into that boot list. Uh, so, of course, we want to get Explorer into the boot list, and there's two approaches, basically. Uh, the first approach assumes you have a copy of the CE ROM image. Uh, the registry file can then be extracted, modified, recompiled into the image. This requires a way to rewrite the flash, whether it be serial, Ethernet, JTAG, or what have you. And the other approach is to patch in Explorer while you're debugging. And this, of course, requires some sort of debugging capability, JTAG, Ethernet, serial, et cetera. So I decided to go with JTAG because it's a fairly straightforward way to accomplish